Chapter 57 Olivia Pine Before They spent another full day at the beach. Liv liked the beach as much as the next person. But it was hard going with a six-year-old. There was no relaxing. It was either worrying about drowning, incessant trips to the bathroom, or being forced into sand castle making hell. She shouldn't complain. They were only little once. But Liv was glad they were back at the rental. She also had her eye on Holmes and Watson. Evan and Maggie were doing their best to pretend they weren't working on the case. But Liv knew better. You'd think she'd be annoyed. But it brought Maggie and her father together. Liv couldn't think of any father-daughters as close as Evan and Mag's. The entire trip was somehow related to Danny's case, she knew. But right now, she just didn't care. Liv studied her husband. He was sitting at the kitchen counter, tapping something on his laptop, Maggie looking over his shoulder. Her daughter seemed more melancholy than usual. For the entire trip, Liv had sensed that something was bothering Maggie, that she was always on the verge of telling Liv something but stopped short. It was probably to confess they were working leads in Danny's case, but Liv decided they needed some mother-daughter time. After they all showered, she asked Maggie to go for a walk. Dad got his dinner with you, so it's my turn. A path to the woods lay just outside the property. Evan told them not to go too far, to bring their phones. Who knew what was in that jungle? He was nothing if not a worrier. Do I want to know what you and Dad have been up to? Liv asked, walking along the footpath, surrounded on both sides by dense trees. Maggie looked at her. She gave the blushing smile she displayed whenever she was caught in a fib. I'll let him tell you. He said he was going to tonight. Liv nodded. I can't wait. He doesn't mean to let it consume him, Maggie said. It's just that he can't accept what happened to Danny, and feels like if he gives up, everyone else will too, and you don't have to defend your father to me. It may not seem like it sometimes, but I love him for it. I've been too hard on him, worried about the rest of you, Matt but I know Dad is just doing what he thinks is right. He'd do the same for any of you. Liv thought of the line, the one from the book Evan loved. You have my whole heart. You always did. They walked for a long while, the sun lowering in the sky, partially hidden by the canopy of trees. Is there something else you wanted to talk about? Maggie stopped on the trail. Her eyes filled with tears, and then she threw her arms around her mother and started to cry. It's okay, my girl, Liv said, rubbing Maggie's back as her daughter's body shuddered. You can tell me anything. I'm here. Tell me. And she did. Chapter 58 Matt Pine Upstairs at Pipe Layers, Matt sat on the foot of the bed, his shirt open, the phone pressed to his ear. Do they think he's going to make it? he asked Keller. Jessica, in all her naked glory, had retreated to the bathroom, realizing the call was important, the mood killed. I don't know, Keller said. I found out just before the funeral and haven't gotten to speak to the doctor. Matt wasn't sure what he was feeling. The only sensation that came to mind was numb. Do you think it's related to what happened to my family? He asked. Or was it just prison violence? I don't know. We can talk about this later. I just arrived at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Lincoln. I'm about to have a meeting with someone who may have some answers. Who? I'll fill you in afterward. I really need to go. 
Matt didn't have the energy to push it. Are you okay? Keller said. When you left the church, everyone was worried. I'm fine, just spending some time with an old friend. Jessica reappeared from the bathroom, dressed, a look of concern on her face. All right, I'll call you. Last thing, Keller said. Her voice was breathy, as if she were walking now. We know who sent the video tip of the party to your sister. Matt gave no reply. We tracked the IP address to a computer located at 15 Stone Creek Road. The Wheeler family. Your aunt said you know them. Matt looked at Jessica, who was pulling her hair up, staring at him with those large eyes. Yeah, he said. I do. Chapter 59 Matt kept his eyes on Jessica. She was slightly disheveled, her face still flushed. What? she said. He needed to be smart about this. Compartmentalize. Put the funeral, Danny's attack, out of his mind. One bite at a time. That was the FBI. His tongue was still thick from the booze, but he was sobering up. The adrenaline was like a full pot of coffee. My brother. He's been badly beaten. Oh my goodness, she said. Is he going to be okay? We're waiting to hear. She sat next to him on the bed. Matt stood, buttoned his shirt. Gesturing to the bed with his chin, he said, I'm sorry about... Another time, Jessica blushed again. Matt wasn't sure there would be another time. And for some reason, he was okay with that. For now, he needed answers from her. Straightening himself, he walked downstairs to the bar. He picked up the glasses and napkins and tiny straws they'd knocked on the floor, piling the debris on the bar. He reached over and grabbed the neck of the bottle of bourbon. Jessica watched him, confusion on her face. Are you okay? Everyone kept asking him that. He tipped back the bottle. It stung his throat, then warmed his insides. The FBI also figured something out. Her eyes lifted to his. Oh, yeah? They know who sent the video of the party to my sister. Jessica's eyes didn't leave his. Eventually, she looked away. Her expression. What was it? Guilt? Worry? No. Resignation. Why? Matt said. The word hung there forever. Finally. You know how long I thought about you? Jessica said. Why? Matt said again, ignoring her question. Everything changed that night, she said. My life was ruined. He had no idea what she was talking about, and it was pretty rich saying that to Matt, of all people. Ricky was never the same. I knew something had happened with Charlotte. I knew it. Then he crashed his car into that tree, and I've been having to care for him ever since. She'd previously made her brother's crash sound like an accident, but she was suggesting something else now. What are you saying? I always had a feeling something had happened that night. After you walked me home from the knoll, I saw Ricky. I told you that. Her voice quavered. He was shit-faced, fighting with his date. After that night, Ricky became withdrawn, depressed. Then he tried to kill himself. I wanted to ask him, but he gets confused now. Matt still wasn't following, but let her continue. Then last month, Ricky was at the bar the night news broke about the Supreme Court denying your brother's case. People were giving toasts and buying rounds. After closing, he was trashed and started crying uncontrollably. He wouldn't tell me why. 
He just kept saying, they smashed her face, they smashed her face, they didn't need to smash her face. Matt's heart tripped at that. He was watching a video on his phone, mumbling, she said. It was right before your eyes, everyone's, and all anyone could focus on was Ricky's profile in the video as if he was the unknown partygoer, a person who doesn't even exist. They made him up. The picture still wasn't coming together. She seemed to be suggesting that Ricky was involved in Charlotte's death, that there was something in that video everyone was missing. Tears were spilling from Jessica's eyes. She was having a hard time catching her breath. Matt went to her, rested his hands on her shoulders. Deep breaths, he said, demonstrating by inhaling loudly through his nose and out through his mouth. When she seemed to be breathing regularly again, she said, Ricky gets confused, so I wasn't sure. He kept saying you didn't see what you thought you saw that night, and he kept watching the video on his phone. When he passed out later, I searched his phone and found the video. What are you saying, Jessica? Matt said. That I saw Ricky pushing the wheelbarrow that night? That he saw me? Is that what he told you? Matt's mind jumped to seven years ago, the figure stopping head turning right at Matt as if making eye contact. Ricky was on the football team and wore a letterman jacket, but Matt had seen the name Pine on the jacket. He was sure of it. But he'd never told anyone about seeing something that night. So Ricky had to have been there. You're not listening, Jessica said. Either it was the alcohol, in Matt's system or Jessica's, but she wasn't making sense. Not Ricky, she said. Then who? Who, Jessica? She said Ricky was with a date that night, but it wasn't making any sense. Jessica had her phone in her hand, the first frame of the video of the party. I didn't know if he was confused, if he was imagining it. I sent the video to the free Danny Pine site, knowing you'd see it. If what Ricky was saying was true, if you really saw them that night, you'd understand the video. She ran her finger across the phone, and the scene of the boys chugging beers popped up, Danny in his undershirt surrounded by boys in letterman jackets, the mystery man's profile. No, Ricky's profile on the fringes of the frame. That's when Matt saw it, and it nearly leveled him. He turned and ran out the door. Chapter 60 Sarah Keller Keller scrutinized the man in the conference room of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Lincoln. Next to the man was a lawyer. She had curly hair and an air of confidence. The lawyer looked at Keller, then at Trey Barnes, the prosecutor heading the case against Neil Flanagan, the former governor's henchman. So now you want to hear what he has to say? The lawyer asked. What's changed? I'm not sure anything has, but the FBI asked for a sit-down. The prosecutor gestured to Keller. So here we are. He's got plenty to say, but I need a commitment. Time served, the prosecutor guffawed. Sylvia, there'd be a lynch mob outside my office. Some of the girls were 14 years old. Flanagan chimed in. I didn't know. Shut up, the lawyer said to her client, not looking at him. To the prosecutor, she said, they'll understand that you did what you had to do. This'll be the biggest case of your career. She looked at Keller both your careers. You keep saying that, the prosecutor said, but I need more than the fairy tales you've been floating. I'm not going to ruin the reputation of good people without some corroboration. I'm sorry, Keller said. I'm late to the party. I have no idea what either of you are talking about. 
How about we go off the record? A proffer. Let me ask a few questions, and then you all can see if there's a deal to be made. Flanagan's lawyer crossed her arms, then nodded reluctantly. The prosecutor gestured for Keller to ask her questions. Keller leaned in, looked at Flanagan. I need to know why you visited Daniel Pine in prison. Flanagan smirked. The indictment said he'd cultivated a troop of young girls, runaways, wannabe models, lost souls, and held parties for rich and powerful benefactors who funded his lavish lifestyle. He was, in short, a pimp for sycophants and pedophiles. One of his patrons had been the governor of Nebraska, who'd been forced to resign when one of the girls had the foresight to secretly videotape their encounters, then sold the tape and tales of debauchery to a tabloid. The Nebraska FBI field office soon uncovered the full, sinister conspiracy. The hub of the wheel in the entire mess was Neil Flanagan. The vile man finally spoke. In addition to my, uh, parties, I used to do other work for the governor. What kind of work? You know, special projects, digging up dirt on political rivals, finding doctors with lax prescribing standards, keeping people quiet who needed to be quiet, stuff like that. You're a fixer. Keller said. The man made a face, but he didn't deny it. So, anyhow, a reporter on Turner's payroll tipped him off that she heard someone had something on him, something big, but she didn't know what. And Turner, he'd been in office forever, so he had no idea what it might be. Flanagan chuckled. I mean, he's so dirty, it could have been anything. But... He had a bad feeling that the jig was up, that he needed to cash out. So he started looking for everything he had of value. And he decided to try to sell some pardons. So he had me make the rounds. Anybody who'd filed a pardon application who might have access to cash. Pine was on the list. You offered to get him a pardon for a payoff? Flanagan nodded. He's in prison. Why would you think he'd have any money? He had the support of a lot of wealthy people, book offers, so it was worth a shot. What did he tell you? He said the same thing you did. He ain't got the money. Keller looked at him, waited for him to go on. I thought that was it, you know. We had other things in the fire selling some legislative bills to lobbyists and whatnot, trying to get Turner his retirement fund. But then I get a call. My encrypted business line I only give out to select people. You had to be in the know to get it. The guy sounded almost proud of all this. Keller bit the inside of her cheek as he went on. So I get this call, and the guy, he won't tell me who he is but I think I know, says he wants to be connected to someone who does wet work. A contract killer? Keller asked. Yeah. I said I don't do that stuff. I'm a businessman. But for a fee, I might be able to liaise. Friend of a friend kind of thing. The man was sleazy, but he made the job sound almost corporate. Keller was literally on the edge of her seat. She wanted to shake the guy to get to the point, but she had a sinking feeling she knew the trajectory of this story, that the person who called Flanagan hired a pro to kill Evan Pine, that Maggie had gotten a photo of the hitman, so he killed them all and staged the scene to look like an accidental gas leak, that he went after Matt to retrieve the photo. Let's get this straight, Keller said. You get a call out of the blue asking you to connect someone with a contract killer, and you just say, okay, no problem? Flanagan gave a one-shouldered shrug. 
The caller knew things about my business. And you connected him with a contractor, the prosecutor chimed in, as if trying to speed things along. A hitter no one seems to be able to verify even exists. Keller was realizing why this story hadn't gone anywhere. The AUSA thought Flanagan was full of shit. And why wouldn't he? Flanagan was desperate, and the story crazy. I was just the go-between. I had no idea the man was gonna. The prosecutor waved him quiet. We get it. You were a choir boy. So the contractor. I've never met him. Just heard of him by rep. He doesn't talk directly with clients. He told me to get 100K and the name and photo. How did you reach him? Keller asked. And what do you mean you'd heard of him by rep? What had you heard? If you're in my line of work, you hear stuff. The contractor, he had a rep as someone who did clean work, specialized in making things look like an accident. Did he have a name? No. People just called him the lip. Keller felt goosebumps crawl up her arms. She thought of Maggie's photo of the man with the cleft lip scar. The caller drops the money, plus my cut, at a locker in the state house, and I take the cash and envelope to another drop for the lip. Why not just wire funds or send encrypted files? Because that's not how he wanted to do it. Flanagan said, as if it were the dumbest question he'd ever heard. Keller presumed that cash, paper, was the only way to ensure no digital footprints. The hitman was old school. But, you know, I'm a curious type, Flanagan said. Keller understood. The weasel not only hid to see who dropped off the envelope at the state house, he looked inside. No honor among thieves. Who was the mark? That guy on the news, from the TV show. Evan Pine. Who hired the lip, Keller said, tired of Flanagan holding her in suspense. The lawyer put a hand on her client's arm, stopping him from responding. He gets time served, she said to the AUSA. Flanagan offered a greasy smile that Keller wanted to smash in with her fist. The prosecutor looked at Keller. He must have been able to tell from her demeanor that Flanagan had said something that resonated. The lip. It corroborated his story, connecting the man with the cleft lip scar Maggie had photographed. It wasn't a coincidence. Flanagan was telling the truth. Make the deal, Keller said. This is above my pay grade, the prosecutor said. I'll be back. He stepped out of the conference room. When he returned, 15 minutes later, he looked at Flanagan's lawyer and nodded. The lawyer looked at her disgusting client and said, Tell her. Chapter 61 Evan Pine before. I'm tired, Daddy, Tommy said. It was only six o'clock, but Evan supposed it had been a long day. The sun and heat, all the walking, took it out of you. Tommy looked flushed and hadn't finished the dinner Evan had made him when Liv and Maggie went out for a long walk. It wasn't like him to leave any mac and cheese behind. Liv constantly forced bottled water on them all, so he didn't think Tommy was dehydrated. The half-empty bottle was next to Tommy's plate. Evan put his hand on his son's forehead, a little warm. Probably nothing to worry about, but ever since the appendix scare, Evan never took routine symptoms for granted. Tonight, though, it seemed like simple fatigue. Hell, Evan could curl up and go to bed right now himself. Let's get you to bed, kiddo, Evan said. Tommy was already nodding off right at the table. Evan carried him to his room. He dug out Tommy's PJs from the suitcase, then lowered him to the bed. Arms up, Evan said. His son lifted his arms, which were noodles. Evan tugged off Tommy's shirt. 
he gently slipped the pajama top over Tommy's head. Tommy flopped on his back, and Evan repeated the maneuver with the bottoms. Evan tucked him under the covers, positioned Sweet Bear next to him. Evan gazed at his son, the rise and fall of his tiny chest, his handsome face. He kissed him on the head and clicked off the light. Back in the living room, Liv and Maggie had returned from their walk. They seemed somber, subdued. Everything okay? Liv looked at Maggie. Yeah, we're just tired, right, Mags? His daughter gave Liv an admiring look, like they shared a secret and it was just for them. Yeah, just tired, Maggie said. There's some mac and cheese or leftover spaghetti, Evan said, or I can make you something. I'm not hungry, Liv said. Too much food on this vacation. She retrieved a bottle of water from the refrigerator and took a drink. Maybe later, Maggie said. She also took a bottle of water, then went to the bedroom. Alone with Liv, Evan said. You sure everything's okay? Liv nodded. We can talk about it more later, but she's okay, I promise. Evan wondered if Maggie had told her about the reason for the trip, their futile investigation. The couple who tricked Evan into coming to Tulum. That would explain the mood. He needed to swallow his medicine and tell Liv himself. He needed to be honest with his wife. Otherwise, the magic of this trip wouldn't be real. I have something to tell you, he said. Liv sat next to him at the dining table. He took a long gulp of water, stalling, thinking how he'd explain. I haven't been totally honest with you about the trip. When you said we could afford it? Yeah, I kind of figured. No, not that. He told her about the call from Charlotte, or at least the person pretending to be Charlotte, about Maggie tracking the phone, about the couple who had set him up. He felt foolish. He braced himself to tell her the rest, about his job, about their finances, about him taking the pills. Before he could do so, Liv said, Well, I have something to tell you, too. Evan tilted his head to the side. His wife went to the bedroom and came out with a thin file folder. She handed it to him. Ron Sampson's wife gave this to me when I was in Nebraska. Her husband told her the file proved Danny was innocent. Why didn't you? Evan stopped himself. It didn't matter. I knew we were here because of Danny, Liv said. I didn't know what exactly you and Mags were up to, but I knew. And I'm sorry I didn't give you the file earlier. We were having such a good time. You guys didn't seem completely consumed by the case, so I thought it could wait. Samson's wife seemed out of her mind, and it looked like just random papers, and I thought there was nothing we could do here anyway, so I... It's okay, Evan said softly. He opened the folder, which held three sheets of paper. Examining the first two pages, he said, It's blood work. It looks like tests of samples of Charlotte's blood and Danny's. The file assigned numbers to the samples. Charlotte's, 4215. Danny's, 5094. Evan inspected the third document, realizing it was a page from an evidence log. Why would Samson have these in his files? Then it hit him. What if Charlotte's blood work had been switched out with someone else's because the murdered girl wasn't Charlotte? He caught himself. He was doing it again, and the separate log, a police chain of evidence record, didn't show anyone having access to Charlotte's sample. Then Evan realized it did show someone. Ron Sampson, gaining access to sample 5094. Danny's blood. Evan pointed to the log. 
It looks like Samson had access to Danny's blood sample for some reason, and he must have stolen the page in the log, not wanting anyone to know. So what's it mean? Evan shook his head, mad at himself. He'd spent thousands of hours combing through the files, pulling every thread, testing every theory. But he was drawing a blank, a complete and utter blank. Liv said, Why'd they test Danny's blood anyway? His blood wasn't found at the crime scene. There was no DNA evidence against him. To prove he was the baby's father, his supposed motive, Evan said. Then it struck him like a bullet. Holy shit. Holy shit! What? Liv said, not containing the excitement in her voice. Danny wasn't O-negative blood type. He pointed a finger to sample 5094 on the report. You know Danny's blood type? No, Evan said. But I know he couldn't be O-negative, because I'm type AB. Liv shook her head. She didn't understand. A parent with type AB blood can't give birth to an O-negative child. How do you know that? What? Tommy's appendix, Evan said. His son's emergency surgery. She was staring at him, confused. Tommy needed blood. Right. They got it from the blood bank when we were freaking out. The terrible memory came back to him. That day in the ER, Evan rushing in late, the doctor explaining that Tommy's blood type was rare, type O negative, and he'd ordered some blood, but it would be faster if Evan could be the donor. Liv couldn't because she was type A positive. They asked me to give my blood, Evan said. Tommy is O negative. He pointed at Danny's blood sample, which had the same blood type as Tommy. Liv turned white. The doctor pulled me aside, said he didn't know how to tell me this, but I couldn't be a donor. A type AB cannot give blood or even be the parent of a type O negative. Liv's eyes were wet. You knew? All this time and you knew? He nodded. But why? Because he's still my son, Evan said. He'd long considered telling her that he knew Tommy wasn't his biological son, but he could never bring himself to do so. Tears spilled from her eyes. I'm sorry, I'm so, so... Evan put his hand on her shoulder, made a quiet shh sound, looking toward Maggie's room. Liv didn't look well. She took a gulp of water. I don't know what to. Do you love me? Evan said. She looked at him. Olivia Pine, do you love me? Yes. She searched his face, her own set in despair and confusion. Then there's nothing you need to say. They sat in silence. Liv quietly trying to catch her breath, her hands shaking, her body quivering as if she were cold. I want us back, Evan whispered, not wanting Maggie to hear. Like we were, I want our family back. Liv sobbed. That's all I ever wanted. She wiped her face with her hand. They heard a noise from Maggie's room. Liv wiped her face and Evan focused again on the computer, trying to act naturally. Then Liv said it. The thing that caused the world to tilt. If it wasn't Danny's blood, if he's not blood type O negative, then whose is it? Evan looked at her for what seemed like a really long time, until her face drained of color again. Noah, she said. No, his son. It explains why no one saw Charlotte after the party. It explains the rumors about another boy. It explains why Samson would change the blood. He'd been friends with Noah. They switched Danny's blood for Kyle Braun's. 
the baby wasn't Danny's, Liv said. It was Kyle's. Just then, Maggie emerged from her bedroom. What's wrong? She said, looking at her parents. What's going on? We got him, Magpie, Evan said. We got him. Chapter 62 Maggie Pine Before Maggie looked at her parents. I can't believe it. Dad, you did it. Her voice broke. She was nearly vibrating with excitement. Her father looked dazed. He squeezed Mom's hand and said, No, we all did it. And you get the most credit, Magpie. You. Maggie felt a welling in her chest. But Kyle Braun? Why? I don't understand. I don't know why. Maybe he got her pregnant. And maybe he didn't want to let that get in the way of his life. Her mom chimed in. And maybe he had help covering it up. You think his dad? Maggie didn't finish the words. Noah Braun had been on their side, a free Danny Pine warrior like them. She felt a wave of betrayal. He wasn't trying to help. He was creating a diversion. Kyle's friend Ricky was who'd identified the unknown partygoer. Noah Braun was the one who got the filmmakers to focus on the smasher. Who's the guy with the scar on his lip and the lady? Maggie asked. Maybe scam artists or weirdos. Or maybe someone Noah hired to pull us off the trail when Detective Samson's wife gave Mom the evidence. Maggie still wasn't quite sure. Why would they lure them to Mexico? Why the elaborate ploy pretending Charlotte was alive? But those questions could wait. I'm gonna go text Matt. Maggie was so excited, she felt almost lightheaded. She darted into the bedroom and flew onto the bed. She pulled her phone from the charger and opened a text to send to Matt. Where to begin? All at once, her thoughts were jumbled. The room was wobbling. She wasn't feeling well and tried to sit up. But she couldn't move. What was happening? Then she nearly leaped out of her skin. A figure, a man, stepping out of the closet. Maggie tried to jump up, tried to scream, but she was incapacitated. What the hell was going on? Her heart was banging in her chest, but it was as if she were paralyzed. Her body wouldn't listen to the commands of her brain. Get up, get up. But she was motionless, petrified wood. The man moved in her line of sight. Holy crap, it was him. Help, dad. The words wouldn't come out. A terrible panic enveloped every part of her. Maggie could still feel the phone in her hand. Her eyes could still move, and they went to the glowing screen, the open text to Matt. Her thumb. She was having a hard time controlling it, but it moved. She managed to tap on the photo reel. Up popped all of her photographs. The last one, the couple, the man in her room. She tried to tap it, but her thumb wasn't listening. She felt far away. She told her thumb to move again, and it bounced on the screen. The photo of the couple was attached to the text to Matt. She just needed to press send. The man ran over to her. Just before he grabbed the device out of her hand, she thought she heard the swish of a departing text. The man cursed to himself when he examined the phone. She was drifting. The man lifted her arm and then let it go. It fell like a rag doll. He crouched down, looked into her pupils. He had a plain face, forgettable, except for a scar that went from his nostril to his lip. Maggie's eyelids were heavy. She watched as the man took her water bottle 
and put it in a trash bag he was carrying. He was fiddling with her phone, connecting it to some type of handheld device. Then he wiped it down with a rag, positioned it back in her frozen hand. The terror left her. She felt warm and calm and loved and proud. We did it, Daddy. We did it. Chapter 63 Olivia Pine Before The elation at uncovering the truth that her son wasn't a murderer. The forgiveness from her husband for her infidelity. The pride in her daughter for never giving up were overcome by a pain in Liv's chest. I feel strange, she said to Evan. Evan examined her, his face turned to concern. Her eyes closed. I'm not. When she opened them, she was on the floor. She tried to get up, but her limbs were frozen. Her head fuzzy, she saw Evan stooped forward on the dining room table, his water bottle on its side, dripping onto the floor. She didn't understand what was happening. She tried to speak, but her mouth wouldn't oblige. Liv tried to reach out for her husband, but nothing would move. It was as if she were buried in sand. Her thoughts were muddled. She started praying, but she didn't know why. A blessing for Evan and each of her children. She felt a stabbing pain in her abdomen, then a jolt of fear when she saw a pair of feet. The shoes were covered in surgical booties. She was a puppet with its strings cut. More darkness than spots before her eyes. Her thoughts floated away in the blue ocean. She looked at Evan again. Despite all of my mistakes, all of the grief, I would do it all over again. And then things went black. Chapter 64 Evan Pine Before Evan was a pile of dead weight strewn across the table. He could feel water on his arm, dripping on his leg, but he couldn't move. He felt the wood from the tabletop on his cheek and watched in anger, in rage, as the man fiddled with his computer, his phone. Like he was running a program to wipe them clean. It was him, the man he and Maggie had tracked to the house. Evan tried to follow the man with his eyes, but even they wouldn't move. The man bent down, out of Evan's field of view. When he rose, Liv was flung over his shoulder. What are you doing? Let her go! The words were trapped inside him. The man slowly lowered Liv to the couch, which was directly in Evan's line of sight. The man folded her hands, which were limp, lifeless. No! No! The man grabbed a book on the end table and positioned it on her chest. Evan needed to find the strength, the will, to overcome whatever drug, whatever poison he'd ingested. He felt dampness on his legs. Then he understood. The water bottles. The man had drugged them all. He remembered Tommy's sudden fatigue. Liv collapsing. His own blackout. His arm was spread out in front of him. He saw his fingers move. He realized that if he concentrated, put every bit of thought into it, he could move his hand. But he also knew he was fading fast. A pen was near his right hand. He watched his hand twitch. He needed to focus. His brain told his hand to grab the pen. He closed his eyes, visualized it. When he opened them, the pen was in his grasp. The man was gathering the file Detective Sampson's wife had given Liv. He put the file and water bottles in a trash bag. He wore latex gloves. Evan's vision blurred. The man disappeared down the hallway, then returned. Evan felt a wave of remorse, a wave of panic. 
a wave of consciousness fading. He felt a poke on his shoulder. Evan's body had no reaction, no reflexes. He was hoisted over the man's shoulder. Staring at the floor, the blood rushing to his head, he could see his dangling arm, the pen still clasped in his hand. Everything was far away, and for a surreal moment, he wondered if the whole scene was a terrible nightmare. Evan was feeling the pull of darkness. The world was a Pink Floyd video. He focused every cell in his brain on his right hand. Then he told his body to do it, use every remaining muscle under his control, and he stabbed the pen into the man's side. He heard a yell, God damn it! And the man dropped Evan to the floor. The man's face twisted in anger. He kicked Evan in the head. Evan saw stars. Blood was dripping into his eyes. The world was fading. The man staggered out of Evan's view again. When he returned, he had a kitchen towel pressed to his side, a large knife in his other hand. He held the knife to Evan's neck, the cold blade under his Adam's apple. Terrified, Evan couldn't even close his eyes now to brace himself for what was next. But then the man moved away from him, and Evan no longer felt the steel on his neck. The man seemed to be examining the mark he'd left on Evan's head from his boot. He stood hands on hips, studying Evan and the blood trail. Then he seemed to make a decision. He carried Evan outside and dropped his limp body on the patio. On his side, Evan could see everything. The man looked around, as if surveying whether Evan was visible from outside the property. He was gone again, but returned with what looked like food from the refrigerator. He poured leftover spaghetti meat sauce all over Evan, dumped mac and cheese and bread near the gate. With his latex gloves covered in red from the spaghetti, he unlatched the gate for some reason, opened it a crack. I'll give you that, the man said to Evan. You've got a lot of fight in you. We'll see how you do with the dogs. Evan didn't know what he meant by that. At that moment, he was in the football bleachers holding Liv's hand on a cold Friday night in October. The kids, Matt, Magpie, and somehow even Tommy, sitting beside them, cheering at the spiral that had just connected and won the game. The quarterback tore off his helmet, his eyes searching the stands until he found them, pointing at Evan and his family, as if it were all for them. And it was. Chapter 65 Matt Pine the front door was open. Matt walked from the foyer to the living room. Well decorated with crown molding and wainscoting, the room was filled with flowers and wreaths on stands. Matt went into the kitchen and saw dishes in the sink. Half-eaten slices of cake, finger food on plates, the remnants of the wake for his family. Kyle Braun walked into the kitchen, carrying more dishes, Matt! Oh, crap, you scared me, he said. We were just cleaning up. We had so many people wanting to pay their respects. Your family was so loved, it was just so... Matt charged him. Kyle Braun flew backward, his arms flailing, the dishes flying, crashing to the floor. Kyle's back slammed against the large stainless steel refrigerator. Matt's forearm jammed against Kyle's neck. Kyle's eyes bulged, wild with fear. Matt screamed, You thought you got away with it! Kyle clawed at Matt's forearm, trying to wedge his fingers in, relieve the pressure, allow himself to breathe. He looked Matt in the eyes and shook his head. Matt felt hot tears on his cheeks. He told himself to calm down, get a hold of his emotions. If he pressed any harder, he'd crush Kyle's windpipe. But why shouldn't he? Kyle's eyes were wet, too, his hand still tugging at Matt's arm. He tried to speak, his voice little more than a rasp. And then Kyle did something unexpected. He gave up. 
Kyle's arms fell to his sides, any fight in him gone, as if he were awaiting, welcoming, Matt to snap his esophagus. Just a little more pressure, and Kyle would get what he wanted. But if he died, so many answers would die with him. Matt yanked his arm away. Kyle raised his hands to his neck, then bent over, coughing. A sickening, barking cough. He finally stood, his back still against the refrigerator door, and he slid to the floor. For a moment, Matt thought he'd exerted too much force and that Kyle's windpipe was destroyed. That Kyle was dying. But sitting amid the broken dishes and leftover food on the floor, Kyle started weeping. It seemed like a long time, but it probably lasted only a few seconds. Matt still had an electrical charge tearing through him. He waited for Kyle to say something, but Kyle just sat there, his whole body trembling. Matt recognized Broken when he saw it. It was an accident, Kyle said at last. Liar, Matt said it calmly, but his voice was full of menace. You killed her. Then you wheeled her to the creek and framed my brother. Kyle took a deep, juddering breath, not saying anything, but he was shaking his head violently. It's over, Matt said. The video, at the party. Danny was wearing only a tank top. You were wearing his jacket. It was you I saw that night, and you saw me, and all these years you let me think. It was an accident, Kyle said again. After everyone cleared out, she stayed behind. She was angry, and she said things that weren't true, and when I told her to get out of my house, she came at me, and I just pushed her away, and she fell and bumped her head. It was an accident. He was gulping for air. Matt felt a slash of rage again. For a riotous moment, he considered shoving Kyle's face to the floor, smashing it into the broken shards. What did Danny or my family ever do to you? We weren't trying to hurt Danny. We tried to make it look like the Smasher. It explained why Charlotte's head was caved in. The differences from the Smasher slains Matt's dad was always talking about. All these years I fought my brother. But it was you. Matt felt a crushing remorse in his chest. He'd hated his brother, resented his father. He'd been such a fool, such a stubborn fool. You! Matt screamed. Not him, a voice said from the kitchen doorway. Noah Braun stood holding a handgun. Get up, Kyle, he said to his son. Kyle just looked up at him, didn't move. Get up, his father yelled. Kyle rose slowly to his feet. Turn around, Noah Braun said to Matt. Matt turned and felt a gun barrel jabbed into his back. Noah marched Matt out of the kitchen and into the great room. Bookshelves lined the walls, high-end furniture, expensive art. Noah told Matt to turn around put his hands on his head. Kyle came in after them. Noah seemed to be debating what to do. He gazed out the large glass window to the backyard, which was illuminated by party lights strung along the patio. Then he seemed to make a decision. Matt didn't like the look on his face. You covered for him? Framed my brother, Matt said. I never meant Danny to get the blame. I wouldn't do that to your mother. The state police had given the governor's office a heads up about a serial killer in Kansas that they thought may have ventured into Nebraska. I called in tips to the prosecutor and Danny's defense lawyer, linking Charlotte's murder to the smasher. Kyle chimed in. That's why I got Ricky to report the unknown party-goer. 
We thought they would think he was the smasher. We didn't know Danny would confess. It just all got out of hand. Maybe it was the truth. It explained Charlotte's head. Explained why Ricky was the only kid who saw the unknown partygoer. Creating a monster other than Danny to blame things on. Explained why Ricky raced his car into a tree from the guilt. Dad, put the gun down, Kyle said. It's over. I'll tell them it was an accident. We can tell them I moved the body, that you and Ricky had nothing to- Shut up, Noah said. Images of that night were forming in Matt's mind, the pixels coming together. Charlotte finding a place to hide in the house when the police broke up the party. Finding Kyle in a bedroom. Kyle, shit-faced, putting his hands on her. Charlotte pushing him away. Then she was on the floor, blood seeping from her head. Kyle called Ricky to help, and they brought her body to the creek. Kyle was still wearing Danny's jacket from the drunken party shenanigans. He saw Matt on the trail, panicked, called his father for help. Maybe Kyle and Ricky were disagreeing over calling Noah, the fight Jessica saw the night Charlotte was killed. But Jessica had referred to the person as Ricky's date. Then it came to him. Maybe Kyle wasn't interested in Charlotte. Maybe she stumbled upon something she shouldn't have. The class president and the school star running back in a compromising position. She found out you and Ricky were together, caught you, and you killed her to keep your secret. It was so unnecessary. Adair wasn't the most progressive place, but being gay wasn't exactly something to kill over. Kyle shook his head. Dad, he said again. Put the gun down. Noah kept his aim trained on Matt. Matt understood then that Noah had no intention of letting him walk out of there. You won't get away with it, Matt said. The video shows Kyle in my brother's jacket. The FBI knows. A lie, but he had to try. The video proves nothing. Then why? Matt said, his voice pleading. Why kill them? His voice broke. Why kill my family? Matt was taking a leap, but everything had happened after that video had appeared, and the only person who had the resources to kill his family, hire a professional, as Keller had speculated, was Noah Braun. Kyle was a law student who relied on his father for support, and Ricky was disabled. It wasn't supposed to go that way. I loved your mother, Noah said. The words hit Matt like a two-by-four in the head. He was right. What does he mean, Dad? Kyle asked. What's he talking about? Matt shouted again. He's talking about how he paid someone to kill my family, to protect you for killing Charlotte and her baby. Kyle Braun looked confused then gut-punched. You wouldn't. Kyle spit the words at his father. He looked at his dad, his eyes filling with tears. You didn't. Noah ignored him. Let's go, he said to Matt. He gestured to the sliding back doors. Oh, my God, Kyle said. That's why you were acting so weird about that cop's wife giving Mrs. Pine evidence. The blood work she was talking about. It was you. Charlotte wasn't lying. Kyle started breathing heavily, like he was hyperventilating. We'll talk about this later, son. No, we'll talk about this now. I told you it was an accident. I told you we should tell the police what happened. She was saying all those things about you, and I just pushed her to get her out of there. But you... What? Saved your ass. It would have ruined your life. And yours, Kyle said. 
She said you forced her. Matt felt the wind knocked out of him. She was lying, Noah said. She said she had proof. Kyle took in a ragged gasp of air. Said the baby was yours. Noah turned to his son, the gun momentarily not pointed at Matt's chest. It wasn't like that. When I took you to see her at the creek, I thought she was still breathing, that she'd moved. I thought... Kyle and his father faced each other. But you... you took that rock and... Matt lunged for the weapon in Noah Braun's hand, thinking it was his last chance. He felt the cold metal in his grip as he tugged to get the gun away from him. Noah kneed Matt in the gut. Matt held on, the air stolen from his lungs. But Noah managed to release Matt's hold. The gun fired. Matt was on the ground, his shoulder burned white hot. He touched it, and his hand came away covered in deep red blood. Noah stood a few feet away, standing over Matt. The gun pointed at his face. Matt lunged for the weapon, violently heaving Noah's arm, running on only adrenaline and rage. The world was a blur, and then the gun discharged again. When Matt reopened his eyes, Kyle was on the floor. No! Noah Braun ran to his son. Red seeped through Kyle's shirt, his eyes distant. No! Noah wailed, cradling his son now. Matt was still on the ground, the blood loss and pain making him lightheaded. He needed to get out of there. Matt reached to pull himself up when Noah's head snapped over to him. You and your fucking family, you just couldn't let it go. Noah picked up the gun from the floor next to his dead son. So you killed them? A six-year-old boy? A teenage girl? The woman you claim to love? Matt clutched the bookshelf and pulled himself to his feet. His head was spinning, his shirt soaked in red. None of that was supposed to happen. When the video appeared, I just wanted your father to let things go. Then your sister found him. Saw his face, took a picture of him in Mexico. He said he had no choice. I would have never hurt your mom. I just wanted your father to... He let the words die. Noah wanted Dad out of the picture. Maybe Mom would come back to him. Or maybe he wanted to end the Pine investigation once and for all by killing the driving force behind it. Sirens wailed in the distance. Noah looked at his lifeless son, still cradled in his lap. His eyes turned dark. He gently lowered Kyle's body to the floor with one hand, pointing the gun at Matt with the other. He rose to his feet. It was over. Matt could see it in the man's face. Noah said, I want you to die knowing that your brother will rot in prison for the rest of his life, and that the world will know you confessed to hiring someone to kill your parents for the insurance, that you killed my son. He was going to get away with it all. Again. Say that Matt and Danny hired the killer for the insurance money. Say that Matt broke in and attacked Kyle, and that Noah killed Matt in self-defense. Fuck that. Not today. Matt channeled every football move he'd ever seen his brother perform and barreled at Noah, ducking under the gun and flinging his arms around Noah's waist as they both flew under the floor. Matt scrambled on top of him and began punching, pummeling his face as Noah clawed at him, blood everywhere. When Noah stopped moving, Matt staggered to his feet. 
Noah said something unintelligible through the snot and blood. Matt reached above to the bookshelf, removing a marble bookend. He thought of Charlotte on the bank of that creek, still alive, fighting for her life like Danny was right now. He thought of his father and mother and little brother and sister, and he raised the heavy bookend over his head. Matt, no! A voice yelled from behind him. He turned and saw Agent Keller, a group of local officers behind her, one of them with his gun drawn. You don't want to do this, Matthew. He took everything, Matt sobbed. We know, Matt. We have the proof, Keller said. But don't let him take you, too. Matt looked down at Noah Braun, who was shielding his face with a hand. Matt raised the marble bookend as high as he could, and with every ounce of strength he had left, he hurled it toward the floor. Excerpt from A Violent Nature, Season 1, Season Finale Exterior, Stone Creek, Day A beautiful day the sun shining, the sound of water flowing down the creek. Close up on bank, where Charlotte's body was found. Evan Pine, voiceover. People think I'm obsessed, that I'm crazy, that I'm selfish and a fool. But what would you do if your son was convicted for a crime he didn't commit? If he was locked up for the rest of his life, and you knew in your bones he was innocent? If your family was broken? You have two choices when you're confronted with your every last fear. Give up or fight like hell. And I'm going to fight until my last breath for Danny. For Liv, for Matt, for Maggie, for Tommy, for Charlotte. To uncover the truth. Fade to black. Epilogue. Matt Pine. After. This your brother, Affleck? That's what I said, Reggie. Now don't look at the camera, just play the game like always. Matt aimed the black magic camera at the two men playing chess in Washington Square Park, the sun lowering in the sky. Danny had arrived early, before Matt finished the shoot for his short film, and Reggie seemed fascinated with him. You was the one who was inside, Reggie said. I am, Danny said. Fish kill. Shoot, how'd a pretty boy like you survive the fish killer? Reggie looked at the chess opponent sitting across from him for affirmation. Matt's brother smiled. Kept my head down, I guess. And ass to the wall, Reggie cackled. Danny didn't mention that he almost didn't survive prison, that he'd been hospitalized for nearly a month. I heard your bro got you out, Reggie said. Matt lowered the camera, defeated. No, he said. My family got him out. Matt pictured Maggie and his father poring over mountains of evidence piled on the desk in their home office, his mother plodding off to Nebraska to plead with the governor about a pardon. Danny rested a hand on Matt's shoulder. I wouldn't be here without this guy. It was partially true, but credit went to the new governor, whose first act in office was to push the board to pardon Danny. The governor's predecessor, Noah Braun, would be spending the rest of his days in a cell at the very prison where Danny was first incarcerated. Damn, Affleck, maybe there's hope for you after all. Matt raised the camera. Seriously, I'm losing light, and we have some place to go before sundown. Reggie made a noise of annoyance and turned back to the chessboard. Mumbling to himself, he said, Who's gonna watch a movie about two old men playing chess anyway? An hour later, 
Matt and Danny sat in an outdoor cafe on 14th Street. Matt had a tall mug of beer in front of him, the glass sweating, the brew cold and perfect on a hot summer evening. Danny sipped a glass of water. He'd given up alcohol. How long until it happens? Danny asked. Matt checked the time on his phone. They say at 8.20. The sun was starting to appear between the gap and the street grid. They'd know it was time when crowds took to the streets with their phones. Remember our first Manhattan hinge? Matt asked. Danny looked up, trying to conjure the memory. How old were you? Five? Maybe six? Six. Like Tommy, Danny said. Matt felt a rush of emotion. What was he like? I mean, Dad and Mom talked a lot about him, but I never got to... Danny let the thought trail off. He was funny. A mama's boy. Like you at that age. Matt smiled. I remember now, Danny said. That was the trip when you had the allergy attack when we visited Mom's friend who had a cat. You were wheezing and you scared the shit out of everyone. Matt had an image of himself in an unfamiliar bathroom, his mother filling the room with steam to try to open up his lungs, her soothing voice, keeping him calm, making him feel safe. You were a real drain on the family. Everything was about you, Danny said, tongue in cheek. A recognition of what they'd given up for him. Then Danny's face turned serious. Maddie, I want you to know that... Matt held up a hand. Don't. Danny swallowed, stared at his brother, mist in his eyes. Interrupting something, ladies, a voice said. Matt turned and saw Ganesh squinting at the sun. Behind him, Kala, looking exquisite, her skin bathed in golden sunlight. They pulled up two chairs at the small table, Kala wedging herself close to Matt. Matt looked over at his brother, who gave him a small nod of approval. Where is everybody? Matt asked. He'd invited the entire gang from Reuben Hall. Ganesh shrugged. Curtis is probably at a meeting for his cult, and watching the sunset is probably too symbolic of toxic masculinity in the patriarchy for Sophia. And we don't want Wu Jin here. He'll block the sun. Remind me, Matt said. Why are we friends with this guy? Kala shook her head like she hadn't the foggiest. They're on their way, she said. Ganesh disappeared into the bar. Danny then stood, put some money on the table. Where are you going, Matt said. You're going to miss it. People were making their way into the street, smartphones in the air, twisting around to catch themselves in photos of the sun as it centered between the buildings. I just love to walk out here in the open, Danny said. I'll catch up with you later. Matt watched Danny make his way down the street, his back to the sun, still that cocksure strut. He had a limp now, a remnant from the prison attack. But otherwise, it was still the stride of a confident man. Two girls stopped Danny said something, like they recognized him from all the coverage of his release from prison. Danny took a selfie with them, then kept moving. Matt had only one regret, that his father wasn't there to see the sight. Kala reached for his hand. A car pulled next to their table. The street was jammed with pedestrians filling their Instagram feeds with photos of the sun slowly dipping below the horizon. The car's windows were down, music blaring. Numb by Lincoln Park. Everything okay? Kala asked. Matt looked her in the eyes. Those eyes. It is now. Sarah Keller
After. I'm scared, Keller said quietly into her satellite phone. No shit. I'm scared too, and I'm 3,000 miles away, not in some hut in Columbia, Bob said. He never tried to tell her how to feel, always validated her emotions, which was weirdly comforting. Keller never used to be afraid of anything, but that was before she had so much to lose. Is the Texan there? Bob asked. Keller looked over at Cal Buchanan, the Chicago field office SAC, who'd helped her raid Marconi LLP. Cal stood next to several hard-looking men holding large guns and wearing tactical gear. As a result of the Pine case, Keller had been promoted to head of the New York office when her boss, Stan Webb, was elevated to D.C. It paid to make the president's daughter happy. With the new position, Keller could pull together the teams she wanted. Some jobs required finesse. Some needed a BSD. Cal was stealing looks at her like he was getting anxious that they'd miss their chance. I want to talk to the twins, Keller said, still feeling the nerves. You talk to them after. Bob was right. Think positive. I'll talk to you later, Bob said. No hesitation there. I love you, she said. You more. And hey, you got this, G-woman. Keller severed the connection, collected herself. She went over to the group, huddled near the only window of the rundown shack. We've got someone coming up to the place, the spotter said from the window. Tough business staying off the grid, Cal Buchanan said. How in the hell did you find him? Airline records, Keller said without elaboration. She went over to the spotter, took his binoculars, peered through a crack in the blinds. A man carrying a plastic jug of water approached the doorway to a shack even smaller than the one they were in. He was tall, thin, had what looked like a freshly shaved head. He wore a mustache, but the stash didn't fully cover the scar from a cleft palate that cut from his right nostril to his lip. The man went inside the shack, and Keller handed the agent the binoculars. It's him. The team stood at attention, the sound of the men locking and loading, filling the room. You can stay in here, Cal said. We've got this. I've got the best breech men in the business. Keller thought of a fearless young woman named Maggie, who always charged in. She got in the stacked position with the rest of the team. Cal gave her an admiring look. Then she and the men charged out the door.